I had heard an interview that you had with another person about how General MacArthur wanted to help, you know, the Japanese um, government um, during that time, that, you know, he wanted to reach out and help them. Um, and that was something in your other interview. And, and so I too was hoping that you would be able to share some of that, you know, uh, through the questions that I ask. So I thank you, first of all, Governor, for joining uh, me, uh, being able to do this for the Library of Congress. And so that would just be for people to be able to see the different veterans, their stories, and maybe just help people connect, I don't know, with the history of you, you all as veterans in our country. So I'll start out, uh, what is your full name? My full name is George Ryoichi Ariyoshi. And where and when were you born? I was born here in Hawaii on March 12, 1926. Wow. Um, how old are you now? I am now 90, going on to 95. Wow. Uh, where, where were you when you found out about the attack on Pearl Harbor? And how did you feel about that? I was going to Sunday school that morning. And I didn't know about the attack until about when I came home. And my mother told me around 10 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Um, how did you feel about that? I, uh, I was shocked. Oh. I imagine so. Um, what was the atmosphere like for Hawaiians after Pearl Harbor was attacked? And did you feel a surge of patriotism uh, around you? Yes, I think everybody in Hawaii felt very strongly that we had to do what we had to do, have to do in order to make it possible for us to be okay. Right. I absolutely agree with that. What was your full rank and what part of the armed services were you in? I was in the... Uh, in the army, can I tell you about this part? What maybe in my own words, uh, I was high, in high school during the entire war years and civilian government was suspended, military took over and they issued decrees from time to time. One of the first thing they did was to say that nobody can be off on the street after six o'clock. So that was a curfew. My security was five o'clock because my mother wanted to be sure that I was not caught outside by and being late. And so she told me she wants me home by five o'clock. And that was during my, all my high school years. So my children, when I tell them that I never went out at night, they were hard time believing that I went through high school without going out at night. Did they believe so you? That's, <laughs> that's, what, that's what it was. And so I, the war ended when I, after I graduated from high school. Mm. And after graduation, I was uh, called by the service in May of 1945. I graduated from, from high school in June of 1944. In May of 1945, I was called to come join the army. At the time that they asked me to enlist, uh, the war in Europe was coming to an end. Then I went to basic training in Camp Hood, Texas. And while I was taking basic training, the war in Europe came to an end, I mean, so Japan came to an end. And so after that, I was immediately, and I don't know how it happened. I was the only one from my whole camp there who was sent to Minnesota. And I was not sure what I was being sent to Minnesota for. But when I got there, I was told, that I was part of the MIS uh, military intelligence service and that I had to go to language classes and do whatever they wanted me to do until I could graduate. Wow. Well, and then after graduation, the, the Fort Stanley military sent me to Japan as a member of the occupation forces. Now, when I got to Japan as an occupation forces, I was unassigned, uh, but I didn't know what I was doing, and I was told every day that I, 
I had to go talk to Japanese. I was asked to go to interviews at the uh, Keogh and Washington University to talk to students. And I went to talk to them about what was going on, what America wanted Japan to do to number one, recover very rapidly. And secondly, to become an American, to become a Democrat a nation with a constitution. And so when we, as we talked like that, the Japanese that I talked to became very happy with what America wanted to do. They wanted to participate and they wanted to build that country as soon as possible. And they wanted to adopt a constitution and become a democratic nation. And that's what happened. And that resulted in the policy of MacArthur, who made it very clear that he did not want to extract anything from the Japanese, but he wanted Japanese to become stronger, and he wanted Japanese to become a democratic nation with a constitution. And that happened more rapidly, I think, than even he imagined would have take place. And as a result of that happening, Japan and America became close friends, and they established a pact that Ambassador Mansfield always talked about the greatest pact in the world, bon on. He felt that the relationship with Japan and America was very, very good and necessary to its future. And so that's what, that's the life that I was doing, uh, living in Japan and trying to work all of it out. My last week, in uh, Tokyo, I was assigned to, then for the first time, assigned to anti-Russian cartels. And the effort was to bring up the big, the Zaibatsu, the big uh, anti, uh, the big uh, firms, uh, Mitsubishi and Marvin and all of those firms. And the question was whether you smash them completely, or you try to have them get deregulated so that they would not be that big economic force. And that's the decision that the Americans made at that time. Not wipe them all out, but in order for Japan to survive, they needed to have some of that kind of leadership and companies that exist uh, to make it possible for Japan to survive and get well. And I was asked to re-enlist, but I told them, no, I wanted to become a lawyer when I was in eighth grade. And so I want to go home quickly. And I want to go to law school and I want to become a lawyer and do whatever I can as a lawyer in order to make that relationship better. And so I came back, I became a lawyer, and I came back to Hawaii to become a lawyer. And then I met all the veterans who had been coming back from all over. People like Spock Matsunaga, people like Dan Noe, Russell Kono, Masato Doi, and they were there running for, they were gonna run for office. They wanna take control of the legislature and bring about changes in the legislature. And they asked, I was asked to participate. And I became the youngest member of that group. And I became, we became the, for the first time in the history of Hawaii, Democrats took over the legislature of the state, then territory. That's pretty cool. That is really neat. I learned a lot, yes. Yes. I learned a lot. Uh, you know, about the Japanese. For example, when I first went to Japan and I heard what MacArthur wanted to have Japan developed as soon as possible, the first Japanese that I met was a Shushan boy. And I was really shocked, surprised to see him. So I asked him, how old are you? He told me he was seven years old. I said, why are you doing this? And he told me, my country is hurting. My country needs help. My parents are hurting. My parents need help. That's why I'm shining shoes to earn a few dollars that can be very helpful to my parents. And I was really touched by a seven-year-old child thinking about his country, thinking about his family, and wanting to help. I got a piece of bread, put some butter and jam on it, and I got out and gave it to him. And he immediately thanked me for it, and he put it away in his box. I said, aren't you hungry? What? Aren't you going to eat it? And his response was, I want to take this home and eat it with Mariko. And I asked him, who is Mariko? 
Moriko is my three-year-old sister, a seven-year-old child thinking about the country and family, thinking about his three-year-old sister and wanting to take care of them. And I thought to myself then, if he represents the feelings of Japanese people, this country was going to make very rapid recovery. And that's what happened. But especially because the Japanese were grateful to America and to especially to Mikasa. And you know, there's a building out in Tokyo right now where Mikasa's headquarters with its pictures has been left out there intact because they were very grateful for what Mikasa did. I think that's the feeling that made it possible for Japan to make a very rapid recovery and to enter into a compact with America that the ambassador Mansfield talked about as the greatest pact in the world. Two nations, one not, not democratic before, but now democratic, coming together and well wanting to do things to make it possible for the world to be better. That's what I mean. I love it. That's the end of the war. I think that's what we were very, very good in doing. And so I, I wanted to stay on some more, but I felt, no, I gotta go back and gotta become a lawyer and I can do whatever I have to do when I become a lawyer. Right. And that you could do more service through being a lawyer yeah. and to, and to right. help maybe even yeah. make that connection even better from, from America. Yeah. Japan. Involved in politics and making Hawaii a better place. And by doing that, I made it possible for us to get to uh, more international activities. And I began to feel that it was very important for Japan and America to come together, but especially for the Japanese people and the American people to come and support it, be, su be supportive of that effort. And that's what I tried to do. So when I became governor, I tried my very best to try to bring American states together with Japanese groups so that we can, they can have a better dialogue and better relationship. Nice. I like that. I was even accused of doing that because I was Japanese American. Mm. And when I heard that, I told them, yep, I am Japanese American. And I'm very proud to do this. But I'm doing it also because of being good for America and Japan. I'm a proud Japanese citizen, a Japanese American, but I'm a proud American also. And I want us together to move ahead. And that's the history of the U.S.-Japan relationship. I love it. I love it. That's amazing. Now, when you went through training, uh, you trained uh, with MIS or for MIS. Could you explain what MIS stood for? Oh, MIS was a military intelligence service. And I did not aware of it why, because in Minnesota, why I was singled out as my one person from the camp to go to Minnesota. When I got there, I was told that I had a little bit of language experience and they wanted to have language training and they wanted me to do, find out what was happening in the Pacific Asian basin and what Japan, America were trying to do. So it was a very, I was very lucky that I was able to get that kind of background and to go overseas and be able to do what I felt strongly about. And, and when you were able to go to Japan, were you afraid that you would have to, uh, were you afraid that you would be not received very well um, by the people there? Um, I didn't know until I met that boy. Right. Boy that I met made me realize that the Japanese were very grateful to America. The war was all over. They wanted to talk about peace now and what they can do and develop as a nation together with America. That's awesome. I love it. You know, it's amazing how you connect and the people that you connect with and how it helps your perspective you know, the situations that you don't even expect that you go into and it, and it helps give you information and insight moving forward, you know, and maybe how to even help them at that time. Um, now, when you went, you said it was after the war was over. What were the conditions like in Japan still from the atomic bombs? 
they were still in ruins yet. And they had to rebuild, put everything together. But when you look now, when I think back after this, in 15 or 16 years, they completely rebuilt their economy and became number one, number two in the world economy. That's how fast they developed. And I think a lot of it is because Mercato was there and because Mercato urged all Americans to do what they could to help and urged Japan and Japanese to do what they could do to strengthen their country. I think that two results very, very important. I think so. I think so. Having that support, I think it encouraged them to move faster. You know, I think that it, I mean, we all need someone to motivate us and to let us know it's going to be okay or we're going to get help, you know, and, but I, I, I'm glad that MacArthur was yes. there for them. Gratitude. And it, it was very important for the Japanese to understand, know, and feel gratitude, grateful. They want to do what MacArthur is trying to get them to do. Mm -hmm. And everybody I talked to, they talked to me about how grateful they were. America didn't try to take anything out of them. America tried to leave everything, make it the country stronger. Now, when you got there, what were your orders when you had gotten to Japan? What was your job supposed to be? You know, I didn't know. And none of my groups, people knew what they were there for. But every day they would tell us, oh, go and talk to so and And in my case, they sent me to the university to talk with the university students. So I went to Wasada. I talked to the people there and we talked about what had happened to Japan, what had happened during the war. We talked about especially where we are now and what America wants Japan to do to rebuild and get stronger and become a democrat nation. And, and you felt like for the majority of them, they were on board for that. That's something that they desired too, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I think that when well, I think back about what happened, it was just remarkable how fast that rebuilding took place and how fast the nation became a democrat nation. Mm -hmm. And today, it is Japan's, Japan is America's, closest ally, looking not just between the two countries, but Japan looking at the rest of Asia and how they can be a bridge and how they can make it possible for that rest of America to understand and get close to Japan and to the United States. That's cool. That's cool. Um, now, when you were in Japan, did you ever encounter discrimination from either your fellow Americans or Japanese civilians because of your status as an AGA. If you did, answer, share with us. The answer is yes. And it's the kind of discrimination that I faced when I was in the United States. Uh, we had people calling us Japs. And in Japan, when we tried to stop people from doing things that were not right, they would turn to me and they would say, oh, you Jap. So we did have the fact that I looked like Japanese in American uniform didn't make any difference to them. I was still Japanese face. It's a, it's amazing how um, discrimination can go both ways. You know, it's a, and it's not always race. And uh -huh. it, but it's it's hard to think that maybe some of your own countrymen. But uh, just the idea that we can come together as people. I mean. That's my hope, you know. Uh, I wish that the whole idea of discrimination and racial tensions, that that's something that just could be overcome. And there are a lot of people who are thinking the right way that we should not discriminate. We should take everybody and bring them all together. Mm -hmm. But we still have a small remnant, a remnant of people who don't feel say like that, who feel that you're a Jap, you're different from us. I don't let that bother me. When I got elected, I received notes from people saying, you know, uh, don't forget, you're not Jap this is not Japan. And, but I just ignored them. Good. I mean, that's what you have to do. 
It's what, you know, it's what we have to do so that we can remain focused on the job that's before us. That's um, right. When you were assigned at Wasada University, what, what was it they had you do there? My job was to talk to them and have them understand what they were doing, have them understand that, make them feel that America is native, not anti-Japanese. And so they wanted us to talk, and me to talk the savagery, goodwill, between the people that were talking to me. Yeah. And these are Japanese who, that was 19, 1946, who became leaders in the community. And it's very important for that conversation to have taken place. Right. This is isn't very important because I think it probably took a little time uh, for them to like um, trust and just really know that, you know, even just coming out of the war, I think they're still like, is it really over? Well, I think that we have to be very patient and we have to know that everybody don't all see things together the same way. And I think it's all of us who believe that we should work together to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it's important to the future of the world and the future between the two nations. Right. I think that's the ta task. And we need to be very patient. And we cannot just attack a person or a community because they are different. We have to understand that they're different because that's how they are. They grew up like that. And what we need to do is to come together, make them talk together and make them understand as well as us understand each other and working together. Right. What, could you share with us what Zabatsu was, what your job was trying to um, get rid of, I guess it was Zabatsu was a cartel? Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. You see, uh, in fact, uh, there was a group that said, let's smash them, wipe them out completely. And there were some of us who felt, wait now, my cartel wants Japan to make a very rapid recovery. And you need to have, keep some of the people who know how to care about and fix, fix the economy. And so that, that's an effort that prevailed. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to make it clear that we did not want to see domination in selfish ways, but we wanted to see assistance to make it possible, the country as a whole to develop in ways that there will be developed. Mm -hmm. You, in your, in the interview, you had said that you, you had heard the Emperor of Japan at that time wanted to visit General MacArthur. Um, could you share with us wh why he wanted to visit General MacArthur? Yes. <clears throat> you know, as Do was brought to by and when MacArthur, uh, when uh, the Emperor signed the agreement to end the war. <clears throat> when he did that, I think that uh, it was very natural for him to get together with MacArthur and to talk. And that first visit that I heard talked about, Emperor went to MacArthur and said, you can do what you want with me, but please save the Japanese people. And the report I heard was that, oh, MacArthur was very impressed that here is the Emperor coming to me and telling me, you can do what you want with me, but save my people. Mm -hmm. And I think that had a great impact and make also feelings about the Japanese and what he had to do in order to provide for its future. Right. It just kind of, uh, I think it probably touched him that he would be willing to give up his own life to help save his people. Yeah, he was willing to give up his own life mm -hmm. in order to save his people. Yes. And Mike also must have felt then that if he represents the leadership of the Japanese, we should take advantage and we should make it possible for Japan to really come together and develop their economy, but more importantly, become a democrat nation with a constitution to back that up. Yes. And that's what happened. And that's amazing. I love it. You know, just taking a little time and compassion and the desire to help, you know, it just, uh, it, there's so many blessings that come from just doing that. And you don't know at the time, but if you move yeah. forward and just help, you know, it's amazing the difference that can later happen. Um, but we understand that no matter who we are or which country we are, uh, there are differences. And we should not let those differences 
divide us and we should bring together. Yeah, you okay, can believe that, you can do that, you can do it our way, this way, but we can be friends together and work together. Yes, I agree. I like that. Um, I had noticed the words uh, Kuni Notami. What does Kuni Notami mean and how did you use this phrase, phrase to encourage the Japanese people? Oh, <coughs> Kuni Notami means for the country. And I think for Americans, it's for the American country. For Japanese, for their country, Japanese, they must do whatever they can to be able to bring this together. And that's what MacArthur wanted. He didn't want this Japan to become strong. He didn't want America to do whatever they have to do with Japan. He wanted both sides to develop and understand each other and come together at some point. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And Ambassador Mansfield talked about the most important arrangement that came to together in the world was that relationship. That's awesome. Good can come from bad, can it? Yeah. Yes. Um, and after, you know, after I came back. I I tried to understand and to have people in Hawaii and America understand that we're not asking Americans to be like Japanese or Japanese become like American. To begin with, America has a large land base. Japan's land base, and that's Mansfield just told me all around. Japan's land base can fit into his own state of Montana. So because of these th different land differences, think things are going to be different. But what we need to do is to understand that and to work together to help each other, to make it possible for us to grow together. And I recognize that it's not just the president and the prime minister coming together. I recognize that people of both sides must understand the importance of this U.S.-Japan relationship. And not just for U.S. Japan, but a relationship that can have impact on all of Asia. Mm -hmm. And so I'm involved, even now, I'm involved in many uh, uh, people in Hawaii, organizations in Hawaii, trying to do things with groups in Japan in order that they can both develop a better understanding of each other's needs and each other's desires. That's awesome. That's one of my questions I have for a little bit later. So we'll go back to, to what you're doing now. We'll go to ba back to that a little bit later. Do you think that you and your unit uh, were able to help the civil civilians there? Do you think that the work that you did where you were interacting with the civilians, do you feel, you and your unit, do you feel at that time that you guys were able to help them to the extent that you wanted to? I believe so. I believe that one person I talked to is Fawcett up. If he understands American policies, and until we that conversation, the feeling was, oh, they're afraid of what might happen to Japan, what America might do to them. When we started to talk, and we talked about America does not want to take anything. Not any, you know, just know, we're going to take all. America did not want to do anything to hurt Japan. Mm -hmm. America wanted Japan to recover get stronger in the hopes that it becomes a democratic nation and becomes a partner of the United States. Mm -hmm. And that group that I talked to, they were college people, they began to understand that. And I think that conversation, that understanding is that was very important. I think so too. When, um, what was your rank when you were discharged? I didn't have a rank didn't have because I didn't do anything assigned to any permanent. At the last, my last assignment, first assignment was two, one week before that anti trust and cartels, but I came home. When you came home, what was it like? Uh, you know, like, how did you guys celebrate? How did your parents feel? What was it like when you came home? When I came home, most of the European veterans had come back and a lot of us got gone started to go to school. And I talked to people like Daniel Owe and Spock Matsunaka, Masato Doi, Russell Kono, who were involved in activities. And it was nice for me to be able to talk to them and for me to look at what Hawaii needed to do and be able to talk to them about my own personal feelings. 
And Hawaii at that time was very, and what was it, un-American. Mm. It was controlled by five large firms, big five firms. And they were the ones who dictated economic policies, they dictated land policies, dictated who gets money, who control the banks. And that's the change that I wanted to bring about. Mm -hmm. Make a difference so that it didn't continue that way for Hawaii. Um, I said that's the change that you wanted to make so that it, it wouldn't continue on that path for Hawaii, that they could have new beginnings. And so you went to college after you got back to become a lawyer, right? Yes. And I was in law, but I had to give up a lot of it in order to do what had to be done. Later, you would become governor. What encouraged you? What did you see or, or what encouraged you to want to run to, uh, to be a governor? What, what because there was still discrimination. My predecessor, Jack Burns, talked to me. And he told me, number one, no local person born in Hawaii has ever become governor. No person, a white person has ever become governor. No person other than a person born outside of Hawaii has ever become governor. You gotta run, you gotta break that. And when you do, there'll be others who might be following you. And so I, my, I was practicing law at that time. I was also on board's uh, commission three very good companies. But I gave all of that up in order that I could participate and make it possible for the community to be better. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and when you became governor, you actually were a three-time governor. You had served for three, three times, which is amazing. Yes. And you were the first Asian governor in the United States, which yes. is awesome. From what time to what time were you governor? What years were you governor? I was, uh, I was acting governor in early 1974, and then I became governor in 74, and I was governor there in my own right for three times until 1986. Wow. That's awesome. Did, and when you were governor, did you feel like you were able to accomplish the goals that you had wanted to accomplish to help the, your state? If so, what were some of those goals? I wanted to have equality and fairness. And those things are very, very important for me. Equality for everybody and be everybody treated fairly. No matter what the background, be treated fairly. Right. So that's the two things that I had. Everything I did was based upon wanting to, is this equal, is this fair? And that's the base of me that I legislated. Were there some goals that you had in office that you didn't you weren't able to get accomplished i think that most of the things that i wanted to do to get the fairness and equality i was able to bring about uh, and i am a very concerned about the finances and i had to during the time that i was governor i went through three very difficult financial periods the oil shock at the beginning, during Carl Carter's administration, the economy down. During Reagan's administration, unemployment at 10.6%. And I went through all of that. And so I had to do that, but I did not want to increase taxes to take care of the deficit that we had. Wow. And so I did it in my own way, and I did it without increasing taxes. I did it without... Uh, I did it without putting a lot of extra burden on people. I asked people to help in that process. And as a result, I became and remain today, I'm the only governor in the state of Hawaii that left a surplus for the next governor. That's awesome. And, and you're very smart with what you're saying about having other people help you to get it done. Um, something that Catherine Cruz had said in her interview with you, um, she mentioned that when you were governor, you tried to find another path of revenue for Hawaii to come to go along with tourism in case something like what we're experiencing now with COVID happened. And that's amazing that you had a plan to prepare ahead of time for such a time as we are in now. 
and has, has, has there been a plan to create new revenue during this time? Just like what you were thinking of back then? Yes, I, and I have been a little disappointed in the things that I've have happened since then. For example, on the island of Hawaii, I got a prawn farm started. I got an abalone project started. I got ogo, that's weed, seaweed, seaweed, uh, weed from sea from food. And I did those things because Hawaii is an island state, totally surrounded by the ocean. And we ought to acknowledge that, recognize that, get benefits from that. And I've been a little bit disappointed as I left. And so what I did was, I just got to finishing my book, which talks about Hawaii's future. And I spent the last year working on that book, putting some of the thoughts together. That's cool. That's cool. You're still doing things now. And that's amazing to me. Um, yeah. I'll tell you something else very important. At mm -hmm. the time that I came back from uh, took, uh, law school, we had lands were controlled by the big five also. And so people who wanted to own a home, they could get leasehold property. In other words, leave the property for several years, but they could not buy the home. Mm -hmm. They could not buy the land, it was not available. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I took all these leasehold properties. I changed the laws when I was in the legislature and I was criticized for that. But I also got the law passed. And when I became governor, I took that law and I worked it out to the Every person who was a leaseholder at that time became a, a, a landowner. That's so and cool. And to me, that's very, very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. For them to be able to experience that they can own some land, you know, uh, it's very important to have that feeling. I mean, you know, you don't have to necessarily live by that. We've, we have only, we've only had one house where we had land um, that we own. But, um, and right now we're renting, but I think that a opportunity to be able to have that, it, it's a very important. And I, I think that that's awesome that you were able to create that for yeah. your fellow citizens. Um, so big five, the land was important. They wanted to be sure that they could lease, uh, lease the land that they wanted it to lease out. Right. And when they leased it out, they were still in control. Yeah. The rent had to be negotiated from time to time. And so I felt very strongly that every person who owned the leasehold should have the opportunity to be able to buy that home, buy that land. And that's what I created during my time. That's awesome. Now, you said that you're helping with something right now still, right? It well, right now, every person has a right and they can buy land that's available. Mm -hmm. So they, it's not only having created land ownership of the leasehold property, but new properties that come up for sale. Any person can decide, look at properties they can own when they buy the property. That's awesome. I like that. Um, I just have to say, you remind me of our pastor. Um, he's a, a gentleman like you that was thinking ahead. Um, and you know, some of the churches do online now, but um, 10 years ago, he, uh, he and his people that are in his group as leaders, um, the opportunity for them to start an online website uh, yeah. was something that he, he said uh, back then, he's like, maybe there'll be a time where people are gonna need it online. And at first the people around him were like, well, it's gonna cost a lot of money to do this. But even though it did, he was, he was like, I just think that possibly someday we might need to do church this way. And so he reminds me of you because he's a, a, not only a pastor, but he's also the head of our, one of our biggest um, homeless shelters here in Georgia. And we sometimes go and volunteer there. You know, he just has a giving heart like you do. And uh, 
I just, I think that that kind of leadership is what makes a difference. Yeah. And, well, you know, people can do different things, have the ability to do things. Some things that somebody else can do, I can't do, mm -hmm. and vice versa. And, you know, that's why it's important for every person who has any kind of talent to do that, not only for himself or herself, but to ask that question, what can I do with the knowledge that I have to make it possible for somebody else to be able to get a better life? Absolutely. And you know that uh, Theodore Roosevelt had a phrase like that. I homeschooled my kids for 20 years. And that, in our, when we had a schoolroom, um, one of the things that I had on the wall was, do what you can with what you have where you are. And uh, he said that when they went on their uh, exploration of the more of the Western frontier in the United States. Um, so that's what he was telling Lewis and Clark was, you know, wherever you are, do what it, use the resources you have with where you are and do what you can, you know. That's the important part. Every person do what they can. Not one person, every person cannot do everything. Yeah, we'll do and I don't have talent to do everything. Yeah. We all have limitations in our talent. Okay. But we have to take what talent we have and we have to pick, do everything we can to be sure that other people get help from us. Yes. And that's part of what this is about is just to encourage uh, future generations, but also to archive it with the Library of Congress, you know, so that they, yeah. have, they know who you are. And that you you know the memory will be there for people that watch this. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about where we are as a country right now? It's a hard one. I'm a. Uh, well, I don't think I'm biased, but I want fairness in this community, and I don't think we're getting that in our community now, and that concerns me very much. If you talk about fairness, for example, that debate that you were having, I looked at it for a while, and you know, the president had a chance to speak, and he was not interrupted. The vice president Hyde had his chance, and while he was speaking, he never could be able to say all the things he wanted to because he was being interrupted, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think fairness in what everything we do is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And the political arena, Give somebody a chance to say what they want to do. Right. Right. But we must acknowledge that fairness. So I want to live in the community. I don't want everybody to come and feel that everybody has to think like me. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to think about how best they can do things in their own way. Mm -hmm. And I want to do that in my own way. And I want both sides to be free to do whatever they can in the ways that they possible to do the things that they need to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I just hope that moving forward, people can start waking up to the fact that they can use their gifts, that they should use their gifts. It doesn't have to be something big, like being the governor of a state, but it's the little things, just like I was saying about helping out with the shelter or uh -huh. helping out in your community. I don't criticize the president unnecessarily, mm -hmm. but I criticize or disagree on a specific point that he might say it that I disagree on. I think what we have to do is be tolerant for each other's point of view and be critical of what you don't agree with, but also be agreeable with what you think is right. And that, that goes with the next question I had was, what do you think as a whole that we could do to be better? And that's to listen to each other. It's basically what you're saying, that being uh, willing to listen and being willing to uh, come together for a resolution. That's right. And they were willing to give up the form of government they had. They're living because they felt that America was trying to do the right thing for them. Right. Absolutely. Um, my last question for you is if there's anything else that you would like to add to this interview, maybe some advice or wisdom that you would like to share with present and future generations who may watch this interview. Yeah, every person in the world 
cannot think alike and do things alike and do, do, do things very differently. I think we need to respect that right of that individual to do and do things around. But having said that, I think it is right for us to say to every person, hey, let's come together. You can defer, you can have your own thoughts, but let's come together so that we can achieve the peace that we want in this world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Governor, I, I thank you very much for your time and allowing me to interview you. If in the future you feel you'd like to know a little bit more about my thoughts on various things that are happening from time to time, feel free to make contact with me. I'm okay. available. Okay. But remember, I'm going to be 95 years old. Yes. <laughs> when is your birthday? March 12, 19. Next year, 2002, no, 2001. Wow. Well, you absolutely are amazing because you're still doing things, and that's just awesome. And well, I used to drive every day, and I don't drive under on the circumstances now, but my children are telling me, oh, please don't drive anymore. <laughs> well, get this. I had looked up one veteran. Um, I'd still want to interview him. He's 107 years old. And he still has his driver's license. Oh. And he has, to, uh, he has to renew it every year. But yes, that, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank well, you very much for this chance. Oh, and thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to interview you. Uh -huh. I hope you have a blessed afternoon. <laughs> okay. Anytime I can respond on anything further, please let me know. Absolutely. Contact Chica. I sure will. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. You.